Hello, and welcome to another lecture with the Cohen Review. Today, we're going to be going over pharmacology, one of the most requested and challenging topics. The presentation includes drugs usually mentioned on the nurse practitioner boards, covering respiratory, endocrine, cardiovascular, skin, psych, ortho, GU, GI, and ENT treatments. Be aware, each system lecture in the Cohen Review will also discuss pharmacology pertinent to that system. This repetition should help cement the drug treatments into memory. In addition, I will teach you how to decode drug names and categories using the prefixes and the suffixes. I created an entire slide on INR interpretation and were foreign management. We also talk about sexual health, STI treatments, vaccines for adults, pharmacology and pregnancy, Tylenol poisoning, and some extras that you need to know. I am excited to show you how I simplified this topic to make it easy for you to understand and apply it to the exam. Well, let's not waste any time and start learning about pharmacology for the Nurse Practitioner Boards. Respiratory, pertussis, highly, highly contagious respiratory infection, easily preventable with a vaccine. This spreads through droplet, so coughing or sneezing. It's also known as the whooping cough. So on the exam, if you see the word whooping cough as part of the description in the question, a flag should go up and scream pertussis because nothing else is described as a whooping cough that is not pertussis. Now this affects mostly children, but it can also affect adults. It's caused by the bacteria Bordella pertussis, usually presents with this hacking cough. That's another good synonym to this condition that lasts about two to three weeks. And sometimes they even vomit after. That's how powerful this cough is, how violent, how strong it is. Now the pertussis vaccine, the CDC recommends the DTAP at two, four, six months of age. And again at 15 and 18 months and between four and six years of age. The Tdap is between ages seven and 10 or for the ones that are not fully vaccinated. And this is the one that you would give your adult or at least make sure that every adult has at least one Tdap in a lifetime. Because the protection provided by the vaccine falls over time, adults need to be revaccinated with either a TD or a Tdap booster every 10 years. And how do we treat pertussis? Macrolides. Acythromycin, also known as your CPAC. Erythromycin is okay. Clarithromycin is just fine. Let's review other respiratory treatments I need you to know. As for strep pharyngitis, this is an infection on the throat and the tonsils that is caused by group A strep. Highly contagious, spread through respiratory droplets or direct contact. Symptoms include your fever, pain when swallowing, sore throat, red swollen tonsils, sometimes white patches of pus on the tonsils. There's a test for it. It's called the rapid strep test, which is a swab that you do on the throat. And if it's positive, only if it's positive, would you then uh, prescribe antibiotics such as penicillins, amoxicillins, macrolides are just fine. And remember, it is okay to return to work or school once there's no longer a fever and the patient has taken antibiotics at least 12 to 24 hours. As for mononucleosis, this is an acute self-limiting infection. Its incubation is four to eight weeks. It's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And it's also known as the kissing disease. <laughs> There's a triad of symptoms that give away the diagnosis. This is your fever, your pharyngitis, and your lymphadenopathy. Now, treatment of choice, be careful. You don't want to give an antibiotic. This is a viral infection. As a matter of fact, if you do mistake it by a strep and you do prescribe a, let's say, penicillin, they will develop a diffused rash a macular papular rash all over their body that could have been prevented 
if you would have diagnosed this properly. So instead, mononucleosis is treated symptomatically. Ibuprofen, Tylenol as needed for fever, but do not give antibiotics. Allergic rhinitis. This is an inflammation inside of the nose caused by allergens, such as pollen. And you can give intranasal corticosteroids. Why? Because there's an inflammation, hence the itis, inside of the nose. How do we calm things down in medicine? We give steroids. So intranasal glucocorticoids, steroids, to calm things down. You may give an antihistamine if it's an allergic reaction to pollen or whatever, to calm things down as well. And decongestants, as needed. As for acute rhinosinusitis, this is when the sinuses become inflamed and swollen. A cause would be like an upper respiratory infection. And be careful, because the boards are huge at wanting to make sure you don't prescribe an antibiotic right away. So in this case, you want to wait at least 10 days of symptoms before you give an antibiotic, such as an amoxicillin or an augmentin, to treat some kind of infection in the sinuses. But again, I can't stress enough to make sure to pay attention on the duration of symptoms on the exam on the question, because if it's been less than 10 days, do not prescribe an antibiotic. Let's review endocrine next. Now, before we review the endocrine system, I do want to bring to your attention that lab values may range, and also sometimes drug dosages, depending on the sources used. But the exam will be very clear when giving you a lab value so that you easily recognize when it's outside of its range. So when discussing the endocrine system, metformin is that one drug that comes first in my mind that I want to make sure you're comfortable with. So let's review. Now, metformin is used for diabetes, but its common side effect, hence important patient education, includes diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, flatulence, anything related to GI upset. Now, depending on the metformin used, depending on the max dose. For example, when you use a type of metformin called Fortamet, the max dose is 2,500 milligrams. But if you use a form called Glufophage or Glumetsa, the maximum dose is 2,000. So keep in mind that metformin maximum dose ranges between 2,000 and 2,500, depending on the one that you use. Now, the biggest warnings about this drug it's renal and hepatic. So if somebody has renal disease or hepatic disease, or if they're alcoholics, you can assume that the liver is messed up. You want to stay away from giving them or prescribing metformin. And certainly if you do put them on metformin, whoever your patient may be, you want to make sure you monitor renal function closely and also hepatic function while you're at it. Now, the biggest warning or thing that we're concerned about uh, metformin is this lactic acidosis. And with decreased renal function, the half-life of the drug is prolonged. And just to refresh your, your, your mind about what the half-life is, the half-life of a drug is the time it takes for the amount of the drug's active substance in your body to be reduced by half. So it gives you an idea of how long this drug is active in the system. So by your kidneys not working properly, the half-life is much longer. So the drug stays in your system a lot longer. It can become toxic if the kidneys are not working properly. Now, when it comes to diabetes, you have to know step one, step two, step three, and step four approach for managing it. Number one, lifestyle modification, whenever you can. And remember, diabetes type 2 can be reversed. So half of the time, if they lose a lot of weight and they come back three months later, um, they may not need any medication, but sometimes they need a little extra help. So if they come back three months later and the sugars are still not controlled, now let's start metformin. 500 milligrams is a good start dose, and you can always increase it up to 2,000 or 2,500, depending on the format you're using before you introduce something else. Now, if you're at the max dose, 
and things are still not controlled, adding a sulfonylurea like glucotrol, it's not a bad idea or other orals. And the last thing you want to do, which is the most invasive, it would be your insulin. Now, remember, if somebody shows up with an A1C in the double digits, insulin is the first line, no questions asked. Let's change gears and focus now on the cardiovascular system, specifically your high blood pressure, your hypertension, which can cause so many issues to different parts of the body, such as your brain. It can cause CVAs or strokes, hypertensive encephalopathy, which can be presented with confusion, headaches, uh, convulsions. In the blood, it can raise your blood sugar levels. In the eyes, it can cause hypertensive retinopathy. To the heart, it can cause MIs, hypertensive cardiomyopathy or heart failure. The kidneys, how about hypertensive nephropathy or just kidney failure? So primarily, I want you to focus on the differences between uh, the antihypertensive drugs, and I've created a chart to make it easy for you. Antipsychotics. Antipsychotics are drugs used to manage psychosis or delusions when people hear things or see things that are not there. Some of the conditions we treat with these include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and even depression, Alzheimer's. There are two generations. First, they came up with this bunch of drugs for first generation, which you can see here. We have low potency, high potency. The low potency we have prochlorperazine, and for high potency, we have Haldol. But these drugs had a lot of the side effects that we needed to improve. Um, they had an increased risk of tardive dyskinesia, extra pyramidal symptoms. Now, just to remind you, the extra pyramidal symptoms include dystonia, such as continuous spasms of muscle contractions, akathisia, which is motor restlessness, Parkinsonism, uh, which is rigidity, bradykinesia, slow movements, tremors, and the tardive dyskinesia is irregular or jerky movements. If you found my teaching style helpful, I welcome you to check out my website, thecohenreview.com. See the link in the comments below. The Cohen Review offers lectures covering all systems, cardiac, GI, psych, derm, focusing on the most relevant material to help you pass the nurse practitioner board's exams. Unlike some of my competitors, we will not overwhelm you with unnecessary material. We offer a growing QBank, live webinars, and private coaching. Oh, and did I mention our free blogs? To visit these, go to thecohenreview.com forward slash blog. I am here to support you into becoming a certified nurse practitioner. So please do yourself a favor, click on the link below, and let's embark on this journey together.